Welcome to our next installment of Chapter 4's coverage of the reaction of alkenes. All right, so after this lecture, you should be able to correctly draw the mechanisms and predict the products formed during the following reactions. When water or alcohols and acid are added to alkenes, when halogens are added to alkenes, when halogens and water are added to alkenes, when peroxy acids are added to alkenes, when alkenes are reacted under hydroboration oxidation conditions, and when alkenes are treated with H2 in a metal catalyst. Now for your reference, I've written all of the sections in our text in which these different topics are covered if you want to consult it for more information. Last, I want to point out that we will skip the oxymercuration reduction conditions discussed in section 4.9. With that said, let's get started. First reaction we're covering today is adding H2O to alkenes. Basically, you can begin with an alkene. This is an example drawn, but it will work with most any alkene. Stir it using water as a solvent and add catalytic acid, and you will place an OH and a hydrogen on the double bond. The OH, of course, goes into the carbon that's more substituted. That is the carbon that was formerly part of the double bond and was bonded to more carbons. Why in the world does that happen? The answer comes by looking at the mechanism. Here it is. I begin with my starting material. I, of course, have catalytic acid, which I just shorthand draw as H+, even though that's kind of an oversimplification. The pi bonds in our carbon-carbon double bond come out and attack that H+. At this juncture, as we've seen in our previous lecture, hydrogen has a choice to go on either carbon-1 or carbon-2. Now remember, whichever carbon it doesn't go to ends up getting a positive charge. So which carbon is it going to bond to? Well, of course it's going to bond to carbon-2, which will give us this product. The reason that it bonds to carbon-2 and not carbon-1 is because by bonding to carbon-2, it leaves us with a tertiary carbocation. If it bonded with carbon-1, it would give us a primary carbocation. This, of course, is dictated by Markovnikov's rule. At this point, water, which of course has lone pair electrons on the oxygen, takes one of those lone pair electrons and uses it to act as a nucleophile and thrust into that carbocation hole, forming a bond between the oxygen and that carbon. This then forms this product. I want to focus on something that's very important. When I've drawn carbocations, that is a positive charge on a carbon, I've told you in the past, and I have not been lying, that having a positive charge on carbon indicates that that carbon only has six electrons around it. Now I've got a positive charge on an oxygen. This can be confusing for students, but believe it or not, when you have a positive charge on an oxygen, as we do here, that does not indicate that the oxygen only has six electrons around it. I know it kind of looks that way because I haven't drawn the extra set of lone pairs that's on that oxygen, but it's totally there. When we have oxygen with a positive charge on it, that's usually caused by the oxygen having three bonds. Now, remember, oxygen likes to just have two bonds. When I have an oxygen that has two bonds, it is a neutral charge. When I have an oxygen that only has one bond, it gets a negative charge. When I have an oxygen that has three bonds, it gets a positive charge. Why? The reason is because that oxygen is sharing more electrons than it normally wants to share. But it still has a full octet around it. So please make that distinction between a positively charged oxygen atom and a positively charged carbon atom. Now, in order to neutralize this positive charge, a second molecule of water, which is floating around and is acting as the solvent in this reaction, will use its lone pair electrons to attack one of these hydrogens. It doesn't really matter which one. As it attacks and forms a bond with that hydrogen, thrusting its electrons into that hydrogen, the electrons on the opposite side of the hydrogen, that is, these electrons that are being shared by the hydrogen and the oxygen, are broken and get thrust into this oxygen. When these two electrons get thrust into this oxygen, it neutralizes that positive charge and gives us this product. This is why we get the product that we get. You'll note that this H2O, which stole this hydrogen, now becomes a molecule of hydronium, which is another technically more correct way of drawing H+. And this hydronium then catalyzes another reaction cycle. I hope you can see clearly why, in this reaction, we always end up placing an OH on the more substituted carbon, as opposed to placing the OH on the less substituted carbon that was present in the original double bond.
This brings us to a great problem I'll let you tackle on your own. Predict the product or products of the following reaction. Water, catalytic acid in the form of H2SO4 being reacted with this alkene. This brings us to our next reaction, adding alcohols or ROH to alkenes. This particular reaction, remember that R represents any carbon-hydrogen chain. Very, very similar to adding water and catalytic acid, this places the OR group on the more substituted carbon that was originally present in the double bond. What is the mechanism? Well, we begin with our starting material right here. As mentioned, we have catalytic acid floating around in solution. These pi electrons that are being shared between carbons 1 and 2 come out, grab that hydrogen, and form a bond with it. At this juncture, the hydrogen can choose should it bond with carbon 1 or carbon 2. As stated before, whichever carbon it doesn't bond with is the one that ends up with a positive charge. As Markovnikov's rule would dictate, the hydrogen will accordingly form a bond at carbon 2, giving me this intermediate. The reason is because by bonding with carbon 2, I get a tertiary carbocation at carbon 1. If the hydrogen had instead bonded at carbon 1, I would have a positive charge on carbon 2, which is a primary carbocation and is way less stable. At this juncture, the alcohol comes along. Now keep in mind we do this using alcohol as the solution. One of the lone pairs on the oxygen come and thrust into this positively charged carbon center. This oxygen now forms a bond with that carbon and gives me this intermediate. As with the previous example, this oxygen still has a full octet. It just has three bonds around it, so it's positively charged because it's sharing more electrons than it usually likes to. At this point, that can be neutralized because a second molecule of alcohol will use the lone pairs on its oxygen, thrusting them into the hydrogen, and by so doing, pushing the electrons that are being shared between this hydrogen and this oxygen up onto this oxygen. When it does that, it neutralizes this oxygen's positive charge and gives us our final product, this. You'll note that what we get is acidified alcohol walking away as a byproduct that can then catalyze a second cycle of this reaction. Which brings us to a great problem. It's essentially the same problem with one minor change. Instead of adding water as our nucleophile source, we're adding methanol. Predict the product. 